In this video, we'll cover radius single sign-on. First thing we'll cover is what is SSO, and then we'll talk about how does radius work with this SSO system, and then we'll move into how to configure the necessary pieces to make it work, and then lastly, we'll round it out with some troubleshooting. So when it comes to SSO, this is a seamless way to authenticate anyone on your network. That way the Firebox is aware of who is sending the different kinds of traffic. This user information is automatically sent via some mechanism. In this case, we'll be using radius accounting. And there's nothing that the users actually have to do in order for this to happen. The goal of single sign-on is to be transparent and allow the users to authenticate without having to use some type of login page or a client software that has a pop-up window that they need to type credentials into. The point here is to gather the user information so we can correlate that to the traffic that we're seeing on the Firebox. That way you're able to figure out who's doing what on your network. You can also use this same system to grant different levels of access by setting up firewall policies for the individual groups that you want to restrict. So in order to get this working with RADIUS, we'll be relying on the 802.1x protocol, a very well-established standard. It's been around for decades, and it's actually extremely secure. The goal with 802.1x is to prevent unauthorized network access. This means that users who need to gain local access to the network must first authenticate to a RADIUS server. This authentication can be enforced through network switches or Wi-Fi access points. And this means that in order to pass traffic on the network at all, not just traffic to the internet, and this is actually independent from the Firebox, this is just local traffic. They can't do anything on the network until they have authenticated to the RADIUS server. So in addition to the SSO stuff we were just talking about, the 802.1x authentication really does grant you a lot more security than most networks currently have. The RADIUS server itself is able to take this authentication when the user logs into their computer on the network, and it just simply forwards those accounting messages about the authentication to the Firebox. In doing so, the Firebox is able to collect a list of the IP addresses, the user information, and potentially some group information if you configure that, and that way it knows who's logging in from where. The best part about this is that it supports any kind of device. It doesn't need to be any particular operating system. It doesn't need to have any particular software installed. Simply having a valid username on the network and authenticating to the RADIUS server when they join the network allows them to access the internal resources and then that information is forwarded on to the Firebox. Let's look at a diagram of this process. So at first, the client tries to connect to the network. You're either plugging in a cable to a switch or you're connecting over Wi-Fi. So the networking devices here see that you're trying to get on the network and they block off your access until they're able to forward your credentials onto a RADIUS server for validation. Once that happens, the client is then allowed on the network. Everything's fine. At the same time, the RADIUS server can forward that authentication event since it knows the IP address and the username and it can take that and send it over to the Firebox. In this example, I'll be using Active Directory NPS to do the RADIUS functions. Looking at it here, we can see under the RADIUS clients and servers, I have the remote RADIUS server groups. This is the first thing that I will need to configure because I need to tell this RADIUS server where to send the accounting logs. So I will right click here and click new and then I will create a name for this particular server. And the server being referenced here is actually the Firebox. So the Firebox will be acting as an accounting server and that's where we want to send this authentication information. After giving the name I'll just go ahead and input the IP address and then I'll take a look at some of the other options. On the authentication accounting tab you can see it has the standard RADIUS port for authentication, but since we're not necessarily authenticating directly, we don't really have to adjust that. Down here we can see the accounting port is also the RADIUS default of 1813. This is what the Firebox will default to as well in the RADIUS SSO configuration. If you're already using these ports for something else, by all means go ahead and change it, but I'll just stick with the defaults for now. 
what I will also need to do is fill out a shared secret. This is something that the Radius server will use to authenticate with the Firebox to validate it is in fact the Firebox that it's talking to, not some middleman. And although I'm filling this out in the authentication section, you can see down here the checkbox is already selected to use the same shared secret for the authentication and accounting. And the accounting piece is what we're sending to the Firebox. So we're good as is. I don't have any load balancing to set up, so I'll just go ahead and click OK. There we go. The server is now created to talk to the T30 device that I'm using for this example. And the next thing you'll need to do is go to the connection request policy, look for either the default one or create your own, and then whichever one you're using for your users, you need to go to the settings tab, and then go to accounting, and enable this checkbox right here. You need to forward the accounting requests to the Firebox. So in this case, I'll be using the T30 that I just set up in the previous step. Once that's done, the next thing to configure is at least one network policy. And you might need quite a number of these depending on how granular you want to be and what type of access you want to allow in your network. But this is where the 802.1x and other things come into play because the radius is actually the thing controlling the network access as well as potentially forwarding any kind of group information to the Firebox. So I've already created an example policy here. I'll go ahead and open that up. And I just named it 802.1x as an example. You can name it whatever you'd like. And if I go to the conditions tab, this is where I set up exactly which conditions I want to allow for any devices on the network. So they must meet the criteria defined here, as well as anything you add to the constraints tab. I did the most basic possible setup here for this example, which is simply saying that if a device connects over ethernet, so through a network switch, or over Wi-Fi, then that's good enough to get on the network. Obviously, you may want to restrict this a bit more. And in fact, you can even lock this down to specific groups. If you're using Active Directory, this is already tied into that, so you can put in specific groups. In addition to this very basic condition, I've also added one constraint, and this is a pretty common one. Under the authentication, I used PEEP, and what I put inside of here was to use the certificate issued from my Active Directory root CA. This CA certificate is granted to any computers that have joined the domain, and it can also be manually installed on other devices. Because the computers that are domain joined have a copy of this certificate already, I'm using that as a validation that these are in fact domain computers that are authenticating to the network. So it's a very simple way to get that done. I don't have to do any extra steps for those domain systems. If I had maybe a mobile phone or something like that, then I would need to install the certificate onto that device, but it's still pretty straightforward. With that constraint in place, the only other thing that you might need to adjust, and this is optional, but generally recommended, is to set up the radius attribute for some kind of group information. In my example, I have used the class attribute, and I have given it the value of students, which is the group name that I'm using for my example. This is the group name that will be passed to the Firebox when users authenticate using this rule that I have created on the NPS server. If I need additional groups, then I can either add some additional attribute information here, or I can create more policies on this Radius server. It really comes down to how granular you want to be, and what groups you need to have passed to the Firebox for your policies. One note here is that unlike regular Radius authentication, because we are using Radius accounting, you cannot use the filter ID attribute. Under here, you can see filter ID. That's normally what you'd use to pass group information, but the filter ID value is generally missing from accounting information in radius packets. So do not use this attribute to pass a group. The class attribute will work just fine. That is attribute number 25. 
the Firebox is set up to look for this attribute by default, so you should be fine there. Once you've created a policy however you'd like, or potentially multiple policies, then you're good to go on the Radius side. When it comes to configuring the Firebox to do Radius SSO, you go to Setup, Authentication, Single Sign-On, and then click on the Radius tab. You check the box and you put in the IP address of the Radius server. Then you fill out the shared secret. As you can see here, the group attribute is already defaulted to 25. But again, if you need to change this for some other attribute that you're using, by all means, change it to match whatever you're using on the server. There are RFC documents out there that list the group attribute numbers that correspond to the specific names on the server if you ever need those references. You can leave the timeout stuff pretty much the same. When it comes to the SSO exceptions list, you always need to fill this out because on any network out there, there are always devices that will not have user login information. This includes things like network devices, such as switches, routers, access points. It can also be certain servers that you may not want to query for this information. So if you don't want to see a particular username logged in there, showing up on the Firebox, you can exempt those servers. And it's also very useful for guest networks because we don't need to find out guest user information and they're likely not subject to 802.1x in the first place. So we don't need the Firebox to try to figure out who's logged in on those IPs. So be sure to fill this out. There we go. Now that that's configured, I'll go ahead and click OK, and you'll see this pop up. What this is talking about is that it will create a policy automatically to allow the authentication messages and another policy to allow user traffic out through the Firebox. And it will also create a specific group called Radius SSO users so that any authentication information it gets from the Radius server will be added to this group implicitly which is why I mentioned earlier that adding specific group information on the radio side is optional. But of course, if everyone is in one group, you don't necessarily have the granularity unless you create policies for specific users. So you can see here, we have these two policies that are created now. This is to allow the Radius server to talk to the Firebox on the accounting port. And then we also have the Radius SSO users group being allowed out to any external on any TCP and UDP port. Of course, this is something that probably should be locked down. So normally I would recommend to disable this policy and then you can insert this group into any existing policies. For example, if I had some students, I could go ahead and add this group here. You can see it's just a firewall group that's present and I can put that in there. Or if you remember, in the radius configuration, I had to find the students group with the class attribute. So technically, anyone that is in the students group already has access to the policy. And this group would represent every other user on the network that authenticated through radius. So this might be a little bit more than you need, it might be a bit too wide open, but it's your choice. Create the policies however you see fit. And if you're not looking to lock down any policies at all, then you don't even have to do the group piece. The logging for the user information will always happen as long as the SSO is functioning. So you'll be able to see in the traffic logs who is doing what, which will also show up in your Dimension and WatchGuard Cloud reports. As you saw, the setup is pretty straightforward. Most of the work is done on the server side, but when it comes to troubleshooting, first thing you can look for are the diagnostic logs for authentication events on the Firebox. You would need to increase the authentication category to the information level in order to see what groups and other information the server is sending to the Firebox. It's also a good idea to check the logs on the Radius server itself, since that's where most of this work is happening. The Firebox is simply receiving information from the server. It's not actually participating in the authentication process. So the server is probably going to be your best bet. In the event that you're not seeing any authentication information reach the Firebox, you will need to do a packet capture to validate that the UDP 1813 traffic is reaching it. The nice part about using Radius is that the logs are actually fairly readable. You can see all of the attributes and other information 
that the radius server is passing on. And if you see no traffic whatsoever, then you know that the radius server is not sending it to the proper location. And lastly, you can verify that the accounting server settings that you created for the Firebox on your radius server are correct. So you have to validate the IP address, the shared secret, make sure that stuff is good. It's very common that people typo the shared secret information. And then also verify that the access policies you configured have the correct constraints and conditions in order to allow people to connect. To wrap things up, Radius SSO is the most secure method of single sign-on because it's using 802.1x, which implicitly protects your network. So this is something that's even beyond the Firebox protection. You get protection on the local side of your network before that traffic even reaches the Firebox. There's no software to deploy. Unlike the Active Directory SSO, where you need to install an agent and potentially a client and other components, there is no software here. You're using an existing Radius server to do the authentication. And because Active Directory also has its NPS role that functions as a Radius server, you likely already have access to this. This can work with a variety of vendors, though. If you don't use Active Directory, there are plenty of Radius servers out there that you can use. And it also works with almost any kind of mid-grade or enterprise-grade switches and access points that exist. Again, this is a well-established standard. 802.1x has been around for decades. There's plenty of support for it. And always make sure to fill out the SSO exceptions list. If you leave it empty, that may create a situation where the Firebox keeps asking who's logged in, and that's just gonna create a lot of extra communication and work for nothing. You need to make exceptions for stuff that doesn't have any users logging into it. And then when you are using user groups on the Firebox policies, make sure that the Radius server is sending the right group information. Again, you have to input those attributes and define which groups are being sent over. And if you need to create multiple policies in order to do that, so be it. But it can be as granular as you'd like it to be. For more information about Radius single sign-on, please use the WatchCard technical search.